Good evening. You're on the smoking section, and uh, my name is Stephen Helfer, and we're on every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, I represent Cambridge Citizens for Smokers' Rights, and um, if anybody is wondering what Cambridge Citizens for Smokers' Rights is, uh, in a nutshell, we oppose uh, what we consider to be overly coercive uh, measures aimed at reducing smoking rates. And what are these overly uh, coercive measures? They are banning smoking outside in public areas uh, where is, there is no longer the excuse of exposure to secondhand smoke. Um, restriction, uh, taxation on smoking on, to, on tobacco, uh, which is at this point what we would consider to be predatory, uh, $5.50 tax on a package of uh, cigarettes uh, is a far higher tax than on any other consumer product or service, I mean far, far higher. And this money is uh, being used to pay for all kinds of funding all kinds of programs, uh, and uh, one of the most important things in taxes is that for broad-based programs, you have broad-based taxes. Uh, and so we feel that smokers should not be uh, the cash cow uh, of the government uh, exclusively. And we also oppose very strenuously uh, discrimination uh, in uh, access to medical insurance or medical care for smokers. Uh, an example of this would be Obamacare, whereby uh, no other condition other than smoking uh, can result in higher insurance premiums. So, for example, if someone is a heroin addict or an alcoholic or is morbidly obese, none of these things uh, can drive up the insurance premium. But if someone has no medical issues whatsoever uh, and is very good health uh, but smokes or chews tobacco, uh, then his medical uh, insurance can be uh, risen by 50 percent. Uh, and also we don't, uh, we oppose discrimination in the workplace. Uh, we oppose uh, government organizations promoting uh, the idea that companies not hire smokers, thereby punishing not only smokers, but by punishing their families. And um, we also dis we oppose, for example, a, a, a doctor saying to someone, well, I won't fix your broken leg uh, unless you quit smoking. Uh, someone doesn't go in to get his leg fixed. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter whether he smokes or not. The doctor, uh, according to the Hippocratic Oath, should treat that. Uh, another example of this is mental institutions where someone who is in a crisis goes in and he smokes, uh, he should not be told he can no longer smoke and because it's bad for his health. He's going in there to treat a very acute condition. So these are the things that uh, Cambridge Citizens for Smokers' Rights opposes, and we oppose them furthermore on the idea that a disproportionately large number of people who smoke are poor or mentally ill. And so these restrictions, taxes, uh, and workplace discrimination is very class-linked. And we find it uh, that these things uh, are even more abhorrent uh, because they tend to harm people who are already in a disadvantaged position in society. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's at least my position, maybe not the uh, Cambridge Citizens for Smokers' Rights position, uh, but that many 
uh, people who gravitate towards the anti-smoking movement uh, have a deep-seated uh, need to bully people and they also have a, an addiction to power. I'm not saying everybody in the anti-smoking movement, but professional anti-smoking uh, or anti-tobacco activists, I think, tend to be people who do like power, tend to be people who like control, and whether they admit it or not, I think, do have a deep-seated need to bully other people. And I think this can be very um, much uh, exemplified uh, for recently uh, in Ireland. Uh, we have a uh, one of the, the which is the first nation in in the world to ban smoking on a nationwide level in all its bars and um, restaurants, and a uh, member of the <clears throat> government in Ireland. Uh, a man named, let's see if I can find his name here, uh, Finian McGrath, I think is his name. Uh, and he is in the disabilities uh, area of the government, so he definitely meets a lot of people who uh, are uh, putting up with a lot in terms of disadvantageousness in society, but having to uh, cope with a lot. And many of these people find tobacco uh, a great comfort and it's also it's a comfort that is even though uh, extraordinarily um, taxed as I say uh, is still something that is within reach of almost all members of society uh, a lot of people for example can't uh, afford a second home in Martha's Vineyard uh, or can't even afford to travel to Vermont for a getaway, uh, but they can enjoy sitting on a park bench and enjoying a cigarette. And so this is very class linked. And um, Finian McGrath has, uh, he's called a super junior disabilities minister. And his personal view is that there should be indoor smoking sections uh, in restaurants and bars in Ireland. Now let's see if um, we can just see, uh, I'm trying to do a little, um, let's say, uh, work here uh, in trying to pick up, uh, put a little, use a little documentary in, in this uh, program here. So let's see if I can get this up here. And... And here we go. Let's see, that's not working very well. Oh, there we go. That's uh, Mr. Finian McGrath. And of course, uh, all of these bullies, uh, these public health bullies, have jumped on McGrath and said that it is uh, a terrible thing that to uh, let pub owners, if they choose, have a small place in their bars uh, so that people who smoke can uh, seek some uh, comfort and shelter from the bad weather, etc. But of course, this would really not satisfy their need to bully. And um, according to the chairman of the Action on Smoking and Health in Ireland, this is one of the most progressive and successful pieces of health legislation introduced in recent years. That's Dr. Patrick Dorley, and um, so it just seems the anti-smoking uh, activists, these professional anti-smoking activists, uh, cannot uh, have any kind of compromise. No level of coercion is too much for them. They see no limit uh, in pursuing their idea of having a uh, Ireland, a country of Ireland, uh, where there will be no tobacco whatsoever. They, they want to have a policy uh, where uh, by the year, I think it's uh, 2025, 
that the tobacco uh, consumption in Ireland will be down to about 5%. Well, I certainly hope that anybody um, who is at all interested in the individual freedoms and the rights of people and the rights of bar owners and restaurateurs uh, to make their own policy on this, whether or not you smoke or not, uh, it's, it's a matter of freedom, individual rights, uh, and a matter of not allowing that portion of the population uh, to be bullied. And You know, uh, and this other thing that they want to introduce, which of course they've been introducing everywhere, or not in many places, but they want to introduce uh, what I consider to be one of the greatest examples of censorship there is, uh, and that is not allowing cigarette companies to have their own brand and their own labels on their own packages. Uh, but this is called plain packaging. So this is the right of a cigarette company to communicate with its customers. Uh, it's not giving any information that it is all considered to be fraudulent. It's actually truthful. This is Marlboro, and we present it this way. And it's a way to communicate between the producer and the consumer. And the government in places like Australia and Ireland is saying, you can't do that we have to, that is, that those words, those images are something that we have to strike out. Uh, the consumer cannot be allowed to perceive those images. So there is nothing more sensorial than this, and yet these people have the uh, chutzpah to say that this, they are living in free countries. Fortunately, in our country, uh, where we do have a First Amendment and where this First Amendment is not only for commercial speech or artistic speech, but all, excuse me, not for only for political speech or artistic speech, but is also for commercial speech. And of course, commercial speech is probably more important uh, than political speech or artistic speech freedom because it's commercial speech uh, which every day uh, we communicate with those people who provide us goods and services, and everybody does that. It's not many of us who get to say something on television or get to put up some big piece of artwork, but it's, this is very much like um, what we, we talked about um, with... Uh, it's the small things in life where freedom is most important because it's just the small things in life that when they're taken away, like our ability to have a cigarette in a restaurant or our ability to buy a, a, an attractive package of cigarettes, uh, that is a way we express ourselves in a daily way and that most of us express ourselves. So commercial speech, uh, I think, probably should enjoy as much or maybe even more protection uh, than artistic or political speech. Of course, people who are in a po position of power and want to even and want to expand their control, uh, they're going after all kinds of speech, but commercial speech in particular. And uh, with that, uh, but the, the, the important part of this, and this was mentioned on our Facebook page, uh, and I hope everybody will go to our Facebook uh, Cambridge Citizens for Smokers' Rights. Um, we have a p person who is in a high position of power in the government of Ireland saying, hey, stop bullying smokers. So this may be a beginning, a small beginning, but it's important. And I think those people who believe in power, or believe in freedom, that is, uh, will uh, take note of this. Now, do I think there'll be a total revolution or a total unraveling uh, of anti-smoking uh, hegemony? No, I don't think so. But this is a beginning and it, it is very hopeful. Now, I think this week uh, I'm going to try to reintroduce uh, the smoker of the week. And if I can uh, get this up here,
Let's see how we're doing here. Ah, uh, here we go. Here we go. Let's take a look at this. Here we have the oldest American veteran alive, and his name is Richard Overton, and he lives, lives in Austin, Texas. And here he is uh, enjoying a cigar with two friends on his uh, on a porch in the city of Austin. Now, last Wednesday, a week ago, uh, which was May 11th, uh, Mr. Uh, Overton celebrated his 110th birthday. And even though he's a 110, uh, and maybe because of the fact uh, that he uh, enjoys 12 cigars a day, which he has been smoking 92 years, uh, he is able to stay reasonably active, uh, tending uh, his own lawn and driving his 1973 uh, Ford pickup. And uh, Mr. Overton saw action during the Second World War in the Pacific Theater, and he has outlived two lives two, excuse me, two wives, and uh, as I say, the oldest American veteran at 110 years old, going strong and smoking 12 cigars a day. Uh, so I guess we call that um, a very interesting piece of datum uh, in support of smokers' rights uh, and, the, uh, and certainly controverts the idea that uh, smoking is lethal. Certainly for many, many people, and uh, we have many, many um, examples of that, uh, smoking seems actually to be the opposite and a conducive of a long life. Again, Richard Overton, who is uh, 110, was 110 years old last Wednesday, the 11th of May. Um, so here we are in the uh, 11th, uh, already in May, and uh, we have the smoker of the, of the week, uh, Richard Overton. Now another um, development which is actually quite good uh, is in the town of Pittsfield. Uh, a store has wanted to open up, and this store wants to sell tobacco, uh, but unfortunately uh, the public health uh, people out in Pittsfield, and they are being um, goaded by professional anti-smoking uh, activists, don't want to allow this store to sell tobacco because they have a cap on uh, retail stores that can sell tobacco. But the city council in Pittsfield, which is desperate, uh, Pittsfield is not a city uh, that is doing well. I don't know if it's a city or a town, uh, but it's way out in western Massachusetts. Uh, they want another convenience store, another retail store, and convenience stores, like it or not, uh, depend on, to some degree, sales of tobacco. And uh, so they are fighting the Public Health Commission. And unfortunately, the Public Health Commission is pretty autonomous. Uh, I don't know who appoints them. It might be the city government, but um, they are digging in their heels. But we will see, because usually uh, a city council uh, can uh, overwhelm the, um, the public health commission. But of course, they, uh, one thing that they say, of course, is that they want to reduce teen smoking in um, in Pittsfield, but unfortunately there's no one out there to tell them, to tell the city councilors that is, that the teenage smoking rate is the lowest it's been in 40 years. So this idea of reducing teen smoking is, as anybody can tell, is just a ploy uh, to introduce restrictions on smokers and on the businesses that depend on them, 
with the idea that we're doing this for the kids. Uh, this is always something that I think people uh, should be very uh, wary of every time you hear that something for the kids uh, and we're going to take away the rights of people uh, to smoke in parks or for retail stores to sell tobacco or in this case uh, for a, um, a new uh, smoking restrictions in the, in the town or the city of Pittsfield. And, um, but I think, again, this is something that people are beginning to stand up to these anti-smoking um, uh, authoritarians and uh, we'll maybe we'll see some uh, a positive outcome uh, with this. Now, any um, uh, the other uh, thing that is not so very uh, good to look at is that uh, CVS uh, is now contributing a lot of money uh, to the what is this new initiative, Tobacco Free Generation, and this is the idea of coercion, forcing uh, those people who are, are at schools in universities uh, and who smoke that they can't smoke even outside on the grounds of the universities uh, and this is something that is coming directly from the Department of Health and Human Services which has threatened to cut off funds to universities which do not ban smoking on their campuses uh, and Again, anybody who believes uh, that um, that you know that people should be allowed, to, or universities should be allowed to chart their own destinies, uh, should be against this. I mean, this is a, a extreme overreach on the part of the federal government to telling universities all over the country uh, what their smoking should policy should be outside. So again, we see how this federal anti-smoking campaign is actually increasing the powers of the federal government uh, to dictate by their purse strings uh, the, the policies of universities and colleges all over the country. And of course, this has no public health merit other than uh, to handicap uh, smokers who work at universities, as I did for 22 years, I would have to leave the campus, thereby putting my job in jeopardy because I would be taking longer smoker, smoking breaks. And students, likewise, and faculty members. And, you know, some people even say it would be putting particularly female students uh, in uh, possible danger. I mean, they have to leave the campus they're not in the protection of the campus. And in many campuses, like at Yale University or the University of Chicago, a lot of these campuses are in dangerous areas. Uh, so again, we see the kind of bullying tactics uh, of anti professional anti-smoking activists uh, who actually, I think, uh, many of them enjoy the bullying aspects that they get from this kind of that the and they this the idea that they are fighting tobacco and fighting smoking uh, gives them the excuse to kind of get in touch with their inner bully, and I know that um, uh, it, these are hard to enforce these uh, policies, but the thing is that they don't even care about the enforcement that much. Uh, by just instituting these policies, it's part of a denormalization campaign so that uh, even if you can get away with smoking in public parks in the city of Boston, it still puts you ill at ease and it puts you uh, outside the law and uh, the law has a, a very kind of moral, uh, often uh, power to it so that if you were acting outside the law, even if you are not in uh, terrible danger of being ticketed, 
uh, it puts you in a weakened position vis-a-vis -vis other people like who are anti-smokers and they want to come up to you and bother you. Well, uh, yesterday uh, we were out in uh, Harvard Square uh, getting people to sign our cards. They're going to President Obama asking him to reconsider the proposed ban on smoking in all public housing. And uh, it's very heartening because there are a lot of people who come up and sign our cards uh, who are non-smokers uh, but recognize what is going on and how dangerous this is to the entire uh, body politic, if you will. I mean, uh, to allow these people to get so powerful and to spread their power all over the country is not just a bad thing for smokers and a bad thing for uh, business interests, but uh, is uh, something that is harmful to the whole fabric of society, I believe. Uh, and as Edmund Burke said, uh, the only thing for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Thank you for watching the smoking section. Good night.